Pizza dough, like most bread, is chiefly flour, water, yeast, and salt. But lots of recipes, including my own, call for some amount of oil and some amount of sugar. What do those add-ons actually do? Well, according to my experiments, which I'm now going to show you, sugar makes the dough sweeter, obviously, but more noticeably than that, sugar causes the dough to retain water during baking, which could be a good or a bad thing. Oil makes the dough more rich and moist, obviously. It also makes it bake a little faster, but oil weakens the dough, which is the negative way to say it. The positive way to say it would be oil tenderizes the dough. None of these things are objectively good or bad. It all depends on what kind of effect you're going for. With the possible exception of yeast. I tried using less yeast, zero yeast, extra yeast, and my findings there were surprisingly conclusive. Sounds good. Tastes more yeasty. Mm-hmm. Really yeasty. It has a gummy texture. It smells like an armpit. Oh, oh nope. God. I'm not doing that. Oh, spit it out. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, up to a point, more yeast is good. Those are my big picture findings, but I learned a lot of other little interesting things along the way. Let me show you my methodology. Eight different sample doughs in eight separate containers. Got to keep them each labeled through the whole process. Each is going to be built on half a cup of water, 118 mils. That's about what I'd normally use for a home oven sized pizza. Top lefty there is my reference recipe, my normal pizza dough, which has about half a teaspoon of granulated sugar per pizza. Some of these are gonna get less sugar, no sugar, double sugar, than yeast. Normally I do about half a teaspoon of active dry yeast for a single pizza. Some of these are gonna get less yeast, no yeast, double yeast. And I'm isolating the variables here. Each of these doughs is different from my reference dough in only one aspect. That's important, right? Now check this out. I'm gonna slow the video back down to real time and you're gonna see the yeast in top righty there bloom conspicuously. That is happening in real time right there. And that's the sample with double yeast. Not one of the other samples is blooming so spectacularly. The lesson there is don't assume your yeast are dead if they don't bubble and foam really dramatically. It depends how much yeast are in there relative to the water. These are all showing less dramatic signs of life, even bottom lefty, which has no sugar for the yeast to eat. The yeast have their own internal energy stores, just like you and I do, and their metabolic processes resume as soon as we get them wet, with or without sugar. Normally, I would just eyeball the olive oil, but I'm guessing I do about a teaspoon per pizza, so some of these will get half that much oil, no oil, double oil, etc. Salt I'm keeping standard, half a teaspoon of Morton Kosher for each. Flour is gonna be constant too, 150 grams of King Arthur bread flour per dough. That's about a cup because bread flour is heavier than all-purpose flour, protein is heavy. This is gonna give me a dough hydration of about 80%, which is pretty wet and what I have been favoring lately since I have moved to a no-need or low-need dough. I'm not even touching these with my hands. I'm just getting each one stirred up with a spoon until all the flour is wet. The most bread flour you can possibly stir in with a spoon, that's generally gonna get you the perfect hydration for no need pizza dough. Already there are differences. The samples with more yeast are noticeably wetter, even though they have the same exact amount of water and flour. Today's video is really a practical experiment, not a science explainer. I will give you my best guess as to what is happening science-wise. Active dry yeast that is sold like this in the store is generally packaged with an emulsifier to help the yeast rehydrate inside your dough. My guess is that emulsifier may be helping the whole dough to suck more water into its constituent particles and that gives it the effect of seeming at this stage more wet even though it has the same amount of flour and water, but that's just a guess. These are all done, time to pack them up and it occurs to me that the labels are upside down from your perspective, that's quality filmmaking Ragusea. And then, like I normally do, I'm gonna put these straight into the fridge for a slow, cold rise, which I'm quite confident results in superior flavor, but we can A-B test that another day. 
Here's an A-B test that we can do right now with the sponsor of this video, Surfshark. Without Surfshark, I cannot stream the latest Great British Bake Off eps from Channel 4, because 4 is a British public broadcaster and I'm in the US. But if I connect via one of Surfshark's VPN servers in the UK, I can stream as many Victoria sponges as I please. Getting around national boundaries and internet censorship is one of the many benefits of a Surfshark membership. Funneling your traffic through an encrypted VPN server also keeps anybody on your Wi-Fi network from snooping on you. And Surfshark comes with tons of other internet security tools like CleanWeb. Turn that on on any device and you will block lots of malicious ads, malware, phishing attempts, that kind of thing. Hit my link in the description and use my code Adam Ragusia at checkout. You can get 83% off Surfshark plus three months free. Just enter Adam Ragusia at checkout, all one word, 83% off. Thank you, Surfshark. Shark. So anyway, for pizza dough, I would normally do a bulk ferment. That's where you mix up dough for a whole bunch of pizzas all in one giant ball, and then you just let it sit for a while, let it autolyze, let it ferment at least part of the way. Then you punch it down, break it down into individual doughs, maybe fold them a little bit, and then rise those individually to bake later. Here, I obviously could not do a bulk ferment because all eight recipes are different, but I still wanna give them a second rise, which is why I'm pulling them out, folding them a few times because that's all the kneading a dough this wet could possibly require. And then I'm oiling the containers so that I'll be able to get the finished dough out without really tearing it up. Folding the dough partway through the fermentation process results in a fluffier bake, which I'm honestly not even sure I prefer for pizza. So it's certainly not necessary, not for a flatbread. Anyway, back in the fridge for at least a day, but I like to do many days. For up to a week and maybe even beyond, you get progressively more intense flavor with the more fermentation that happens as you go. I have a whole video about that in the description where you can see a dough at one day old, two days old, three days old, etc. These are now five days old and I'm gonna bake them. It is pizza dough, but I'm not baking pizza with it. I'm baking what my kids call pizza bread. Gently pull the dough out without deflating it, turn it upside down so the bubbly side is on top. Smear that with olive oil, top with black pepper, coarse salt, and garlic powder. Bake at maximum heat on a hot stone or steel. This will be less wasteful than baking eight full pizzas. I can bake four at a time, so all four will get a similar bake, and that'll help us isolate the ingredient variables. Plus, with pizza the bread, you can assess the dough itself a little bit more easily. Its more subtle characteristics will not be drowned out by the sauce and the cheese and all that. Gotta keep the label with the bread at all times or this entire exercise will have been for nothing. Here's my reference dough, my standard recipe. Teaspoon of oil, half a teaspoon each of sugar and yeast. Tastes great, fluffy yet moist and chewy, nice fermented yeasty flavor, and a very subtle sweetness that I only notice after I've been chewing on it for a sec. In fact, let's first consider the effects of sugar on the dough. As you saw, all seven of my doughs that had yeast in them were able to rise just fine with or without sugar. This is because flour generally has enzymes in it that will break the starch molecules down into fermentable sugars that the yeast can actually eat and ferment and all that kind of good stuff. So sugar is absolutely not necessary. Like here is my normal dough with half a teaspoon of sugar. Here is my dough with zero sugar. The zero sugar dough puffed up almost as tall in the fridge, though it feels less sticky. Less sticky, Adam. That's me leaving notes for myself, which I'm sure sounds totally normal and not at all crazy. Once baked, the zero sugar dough looks a lot browner, but I think that mostly had to do with its position in the oven. It is generally agreed upon that sugar enhances browning in bread, but this experiment was not able to isolate that particular variable. Anyway, we can talk about the internal taste and texture difference, which is very noticeable, and it has very little to do with sweetness. I can vaguely taste at the end of the bite. I can taste the, the relative lack of sweetness. Nevertheless, pizza dough with no sugar in it tastes really different, or at least the texture is different. It is fluffier and it is chewier. Sugar weakens gluten and it retains water during baking. I think the lack of sugar here allowed more water to convert to steam and the stronger gluten network was more able to capture that steam in the form of bubbles, hence fluffier texture. And the taste of the zero sugar dough is more bready. Sorry, that's the best thing that I can think of to describe it. It's more of the just kind of purer, cleaner taste of 
plain bread. I would not say that I prefer it to my standard dough that has a little sugar in it. To me, they're just two totally different things with their own pros and cons, though too much sugar is definitely a thing. This dough got double sugar, a full teaspoon, and you can see it puffed up a little more. We got a gassier fermentation out of it, and it is very sticky. That would be much more challenging to shape into a thin crust pizza and have any hope of sliding it off the peel into the oven. Once baked, you can see the difference in the interior texture, which is very moist and dense, almost like it was underbaked. Lauren was not a fan. It tastes like it's a savory bread that is wanting to be a cinnamon roll. <laughs> Yeah, and that's not because it tasted sweet. It did not taste particularly sweet to me, but sugar holds on to water, so less water was able to escape as steam during baking. You also have less steam puffing up the texture, and you have a weaker gluten network that is less able to expand into bubbles in response to that vapor pressure. So the resulting bread is texturally cakey. Sugar is responsible for that cakey texture, at least in part. And that could actually be nice in, say, a thick crust pizza, but for a typical thin crust, nah. I don't think I'm ever gonna use more than half a teaspoon of sugar per small pizza ever again. How about oil? Sample number two here has absolutely no oil inside it, just a thin coating on the outside. It seemed to rise just as high as my reference recipe, but the raw dough was noticeably stickier. Maybe that's just a lack of the lubricating effect of oil. And despite baking in the hottest corner of my oven, it baked up lighter than the others in the same batch, except for that one burned patch there. Really, the zero oil dough needed another minute or two in the oven, and this makes sense. Oil speeds up cooking. This is because oil can get much hotter than water can, liquid water, and because oil is such an effective thermal interface. I have a whole video about that in the description. But if you look past that slight underbaked taste and texture, the interior of the no oil bread is quite nice. Again, I would just describe it as more bready than my typical pizza dough, more of the pure taste and texture of bread without the extra richness and moisture of the oil. They're very fluffy. Uh, yep, that makes sense. Fat weakens gluten. So without fat, this was able to form bigger bubbles in the oven. It got more oven spring from the steam. The resulting texture is pillowy, which again, I would not say is intrinsically better or worse than my normal dough. It's just a different vibe. Over here is my dough with double oil. Actually, I think I might've given it triple oil. The raw dough is not especially sticky to the touch, but it is softer. I can tell that if I tried to stretch this out thin, it would probably rip. Fat weakens gluten, so that makes sense. Bake that up, very crispy bottom on that. It looks pretty similar inside, but wow, does it taste different. Oh, you can tell. It just falls apart in your mouth. Yeah. Fat is the other thing that gets you cakey texture. Fat weakens gluten, so you get this very tender, very yielding bread. Your, your teeth kind of cut through that bread like a hot knife through butter, which again, could be a very nice thing in a thick crust pizza. So I'm not gonna call this objectively good or bad, but I'm gonna get much less ambivalent when we start talking about yeast. This is my batch with half my normal amount of yeast. You can see that we got a feeble rise with just a quarter teaspoon of yeast, and the underside has less of the bubbly surface that holds oil and crisps up really nice when I do pizza bread, so boo to that. The low yeast dough bakes up a little bit flatter, and you can see the bottom layer is gummy and doughy. I think that's because our feeble fermentation did not create enough seed bubbles in there. There were no little pockets for steam to build up and expand. And the taste? It tastes like bath water or something. I don't know. Yeah, it just doesn't taste as good. No. Here's the thing. Much of the stuff in bread doesn't taste very good. Warm, wet flour doesn't taste good. I think that's the like bath water taste that Lauren was talking about. What makes it taste good is high heat, which you only get on the exterior of the bread. On the interior, what makes flour taste good is fermentation. The chemical products of fermentation taste great, and we simply have less of them in this bread that we baked with less yeast. We can take that to its logical extreme in this dough that has zero yeast. I thought it might ferment a bit. Flour has some yeast in it naturally. The environment in your house has yeast in it naturally. And if we had left this at room temperature, it probably would have puffed up a bit like a sourdough starter, but not in the fridge. Not enough yeast to overcome the cold. It feels like Play-Doh. And here it is baked. 
It puffed up a little bit in the oven purely from steam, but I still don't really want to eat it. In the name of science. <laughs> oh, it smells like an armpit. Oh, oh nope, God. I'm not doing that. Oh, spit out. Oh. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> no. Yeah, basically that tasted like a raw flour tortilla. Cook a tortilla and it tastes pretty good because effectively it has no inside, only outside, and the outside got high heat, which made it taste good. This massive unfermented interior just tastes like warm, wet flour, which is strikingly similar to warm, wet dog hair, even grosser than I was expecting. But here's where things get really interesting. My batch with double yeast. Normally, I would use about half a teaspoon of yeast for a small home oven sized pizza. This one got a full teaspoon. It did not rise up that much more than my reference recipe. It is noticeably stickier and more delicate to handle. It baked up a little bit lighter. I think that was just oven position though. The interior is maybe a little fluffier than the reference recipe, but what really stands out is the flavor. The flavor of the double yeast dough was outstanding, by far our favorite. It was just so yeasty and fermented and funky and, and sour. It was noticeably sour, which I realize not everybody might like, but I sure did. Certainly there's gotta be an upper limit on yeast. Too much fermentation definitely weakens the gluten and potentially creates too much gas. This causes breads to overproof and collapse, but that doesn't really matter when you're making a flat bread like pizza or pizza bread. One of the many reasons I like making pizza and naan and other flat breads here at home is because flat breads are just way less fussy and they leave you a much wider margin of error than tall breads. Tall breads, a lot more can go wrong and I generally leave them to the professionals. Really, the only downside to extra yeast that I see in pizza making is the gluten problem. Too much yeast and it will not be able to stretch out super thin into a thin crust pizza without tearing. But for a thick crust pizza, I'm going double yeast from now on. I'm sure there's an upper limit on that, but I have not yet hit it. In contrast, my children have hit their upper limit on pizza bread. It's somewhere between three and four loaves. I'll notify the science journals immediately. 